Hello and welcome to the Must Talk podcast. This is Connor O'Boyle. Today I'll be speaking with David Newman. David is a well-respected composer and conductor. He is the son of composer Alfred Newman, the brother of composer Thomas Newman, and the cousin of composer Randy Newman. So there's definitely something right in the Newman family. He has scored numerous movies, such as The Nutty Professor, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, Anastasia, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award, Matilda, and The War of the Roses, to name a few. David frequently conducts the LA Phil at the Hollywood Bowl, playing the music of John Williams and others, and we hit various topics, such as his time as a session musician, playing on the likes of E.T., uh, his move over to composition, and what he learned uh, through the years composing on the job, and his attitude to the change in the industry, how he approaches conducting, and what he thinks the future holds for composition and for film music in general. So, without further preamble, I give you David Newman. Okay, so I am here with uh, David Newman. David, thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I know you're uh, you're short on time, so let's uh, let's jump right in. For people who don't know who you are, I, I will have given you a, a short bio and a short intro uh, be- okay. before uh, we jump straight into it. But I'd like to hear from your own uh, perspective. You know how you view what you do. Um, okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> I live in Los Angeles, uh, which is where Hollywood is. I grew up here. I'm a native. Um, I went to university here at a place called uh, USC, which was downtown in Los Angeles, uh, and I studied uh, violin performance, uh, and I was doing a bit of conducting uh, in my 20s, uh, and I was eventually working in the studios, uh, playing violin professionally, freelance. There was quite a lot of work. Uh, I started working in about 1977. Uh, Mm -hmm. I worked a lot for John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, I got sort of a bird's eye view of that era, the the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I stopped doing uh, violin professionally around 84, 85. So it was about eight years that I was uh, doing it. I played on hundreds of films and a lot of uh, television. Um, I really had no interest whatsoever in composing. I'd never studied composing with anyone. I, my, my goal had been to be, um, a conductor. Mm. So I was studying conducting, uh, in my twenties while I was, uh, gigging was what we got, you know, I was a working violinist. Um, and I just, and I got a master's in conducting at USC, which is just a couple of years after the four years of university. Um, and I just, didn't see much future in it. So I thought I would, I I sort of made a decision to start doing film composing. And I initially worked with another person, but it took me about, took me about four or five years to really uh, get my sea legs, so to speak. Uh, It didn't come really natural to me. Um, I did a, a couple of industrial films. I did an early Tim Burton stop frame animation film that he did, um, which he later did um, fairly recently uh, called Frankenweenie, mm-hmm. um, it, which was a big orchestra score. I did that with the guy I was partnering with. Um, and I was doing a little conducting here and there, film stuff, but not, you know, not really much of anything. And then I, um, I got um, a few kind of like B movies uh, most of them were kind of synth, and then at the time, I don't know, you uh, small orchestras and do some overdubbing, and th- there wasn't much um, ability to go overseas when I started. I mean, people were doing it, obviously, but it there weren't very many places you could go inexpensively to record because uh, players really couldn't d- do it. Uh, like now, you can pretty much go. There are lots of places to go around the world now where the orchestras are very familiar with, for instance, playing to click tracks and and following enough so that you can synchronize and be able to play different styles of music and pull different kinds of eclectic styles into orchestra playing and and, and knowing what 
orchestra playing needs to be for a film, the peculiar way that you need to play, which is something if you want to talk about. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, we can get into that for sure. Uh, but um, and I and, and then I got this film called Critters, which was actually more of a mainstream. I mean, it wasn't a mainstream film, but it was it was a real film. I would say it was a little bit less than a B movie or a C movie. And then um, did a a Disney movie called Brave Little Toaster, which I did very early on in my career. And that's, I think, where I really learned um, what I was uh, kind of what, what, what was entailed in scoring a movie. And I'll tell you what I really learned. Um, uh, Brave Little Toaster, we had to go, we went to Japan to record it. We recorded in a beautiful hall with a great orchestra that's orchestra that Seiji Ozawa um, had. Uh, it was like 86 or 87, I think. But the day before we left, there was a seven minute cue that I had to do. And I thought, well, I can do this. You know, I just, I really didn't know how much I could do in a day. So it took me the entire day to sketch it. I was sketching at the time. Uh, sketching means, um, that you write in a like compressed format. You maybe have eight, what are called staves and you write your music and you sort of label who is playing it, but it's not a full score. It's not something that a copyist really can make the parts for so that the orchestra can play. Mm -hmm. So I then had to orchestrate it. So I stayed up all night uh, and I, st I started to orchestrate it. I think it was like 500 bars or something. And I had to work for almost 50 straight hours. I worked the entire plane flight. I worked the entire next day. I don't think I slept for 60 or 70 hours. Wow. And But I learned the kind of discipline limits, the mm -hmm. craftsmanship versus, um, versus the art mm -hmm. of it. It's a lot of craftsmanship in scoring movies. You have to push yourself whether you're – quote unquote feeling it or 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 not right um and it was a really good lesson for me it turned out really good because the orchestra was really good the hall was really good uh, i learned how to how to fix things that it's not that hard to fix uh something that a director is not over the top about or wants different uh, i learned that we musicians think things are really complicated and generally these kinds of revisions or fixes or however you want to call it, aren't really all that complicated. Right. It's too, it's too loud. It's too soft. It's too dark. It's too light. It's not funny. It's too funny. It's there, the, the, you know, there's like seven or eight things that it's not emotional enough. It's too emotional. Um, that just come up over and sort of over and over. Um, I mean, you know, with as long as you, you you're down the path to 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 the point where you know it's going to be an orchestra. And you know what kind of style it is and 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 all that. But the the uh, it, it's very easy. You know, and and I'm thank God I had the background of playing in orchestras all my life. Um, my brother and I played in orchestras from the time we were like eight years old, and then when we got to be ten or eleven. There's a big community here uh, in Los Angeles of what are called community orchestras, and they're kind of uh, they're sort of amateur orchestras that then hire professionals right before the concert, and then they give concerts. And there's there were like seven or eight of them, and we used to play in a, two or three of them, two or three nights a week, um, you know, year after year. So I learned all the literature. I had been to hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of rehearsals. By the time I got out of um, college, uh, out of USC, so I know how an orchestra person thinks, and I just never knew it from the side of composing. I, I knew it from the conducting side and the playing side, um, but the composing side, I, I sort of had to learn this: that you can, it's relatively easy to fix things on the spot with an orchestra. There, I mean, quite frankly, the way I write now, which I didn't then. Um, when I first started writing, mocking up on a on samplers was just very few. You only did it if you couldn't read music. So 
I wrote everything out by hand. I had no orchestrators because we had no, I didn't have any orchestrators till I was like almost 40 films into my career just because I got paid, you know, you got paid more for orchestrating. So I, I and, and quite frankly, I would, uh, my handwriting was so bad. I just, it was easier to write into a full score than it was to sketch and then orchestrate. So I just started in Right now, now, of course, with toaster, that's another thing I learned with Brave Little Toaster. I probably shouldn't sketch. I probably should just write right into the orchestra as I as I go. You know, or I write some I write some music. I write eight or ten or sixteen bars of music, and then I fill it out. And then I write eight more bars and fill it out. And 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 then when I'm done, I'm done. You know, I it's 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 orchestrated. Um, so I had to sort I had to sort of. I had to sort of learn all that stuff on the fly. And I think then after Brave Little Toaster, I got, which was really a break for me, I got this movie called Throw Mama from the Train, which was my, my first film with Danny DeVito. And I got that movie because he tempted um, music from Critters into, into Throw Mama from the Train. I mean, it, it didn't really make any sense to me at the time. It, it didn't really seem to fit the movie, but he loved the, the dark humor in the Critters story. Critters is kind of a horror comedy, but it's, it, it's, it, it's very dark Critters, but it's also funny. And most of Danny's movies kind of tilt that way. They're they're If you think the next film we did was the war, the war of the roses, which James, James Brooks um, uh, was the producer. And that's another movie that straddles, funny and um you know dark i mean it's 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 kind of shakespearean in a in this fight to the death of uh, divorce is a fight to the death but um then i did throw mom from the train and then i had the to that date the most seminal experience of my life which was i wrote and recorded a, the main title for uh throw mama from the train it was short, you know. It's based on a Bernard Herrmann, um, "Strangers on a Train." It's based on that on that movie, um, which is a earlier Hitchcock movie. And so, the score is kind of Herman esque, Bernard Herrmann esque in a, in a way. So I wrote a main title. Danny happened to not be there because his uh, youngest kid, his son, was born that the night we had that session. So he wasn't even there. Recorded this main title, and then. Over the course of the next few days, um, he just did, he didn't he just didn't like it, and it wasn't it wasn't like it was too dark. It wasn't dark enough. It, it, it was it just it was the wrong concept somehow, and he really couldn't he really couldn't articulate it. Um, so it was really freaky because I that had never happened to me that that, that way where where. It wasn't just fixing this part or that part. It was the whole concept was was wrong, or somehow wasn't wasn't working. So now, when I look back, it was perfectly obvious. But at the time, it wasn't. So I went back. Uh, I got upset. Um, I had to learn this too that you you have to give yourself time to be upset. Because if you're not upset, it means that you don't really care about what you're writing. It's not personal enough. If you know somebody says they hate what you wrote, it's just human nature to be upset about it. So you just you can't let it stop you. You have to move forward, but you still have to allow yourself that. So I thought about it. I was upset, and you know, and then I just started thinking about it and reworking it. And it started to get really um, interesting to go back to something I'd already been through and composed. And I, I started to see that it was just too much on the, it tilted too much to, to the dark side. So I thought weird and quirky and funny and still have enough dark in it. And so I worked on it. I, I used a lot of um, uh, quick, differences in 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 more quirky comedic to dark uh without any transitions just kind of flipping back and forth and i came up with the beginning right at the beginning of the main title which i thought worked really well there was a slide whistle in it danny loved all the 
you know, all the toy instruments. I, I used a lot of toy instrument, toy percussion instruments in it. Um, and it just all started to come together. And so I wrote it and we went and did it again. And he was just over the moon about it. And on looking back, even then, I thought, you know, this couldn't have worked out better. This this was like he didn't like something and he didn't really know why he didn't like it or why it didn't work. And then I solved the problem. So I seemed like a magician to him. So now he's going to use me on every movie because he knows he I'm capable of revising something to, for, for, for him or fixing something for him. And that that served me well for a long time in my career, um, being able to fix things. Quite honestly, as, as, as my career went on and we started to mock up uh, everything, mock, do you think your listeners know what mocking up is? Uh, yeah, mo- most of them probably would, but it wouldn't be a bad thing just to you know touch over it very quickly. All it is is that you use samplers. You use a digital, what's called a DAW, digital audio workstation, uh, to ru- to write your music, and um, it sounds fairly close to an orchestra. And then you send that to the, to the director, and then they cut it in, and then you discuss it based on what's called your you know your mock up, whether they like it. Uh, so as I as I got to mocking up, I had a few other of these situations. I can go into detail or not, but. Um, I had another experience like this on a movie called Galaxy Quest, which was in the 90s, I think 1999. But what happened is that when you're sitting in front of your DAW, it's kind of what, like my experience with Galaxy Quest was similar, except that I had to fix it with the orchestra sitting there and the chorus sitting there and the filmmakers in Northern California and me in Southern California, and we were using these things called ISD, ISDN lines. And they didn't like, and I'd even mocked this up. They didn't like the end of the end of the movie cue, the finale. Cue. And I had to, I had to, I ended up having to write or add about 50, 55 bars in the queue. So once I figured out what to do, that it needed to be, it needed to go fast. It was a little plotting. The tempo was too slow. Um, it wasn't triumphant and hard, heartfelt enough. I just sat at the piano as if I was sitting in front of my computer and started writing and telling them what to do. And the, again, a, a, a difference with orchestras like this that do film, most of the time it's boring, which is what I found, which started to drive me crazy, which is why I embarked on this film music thing in the first place. But when things get weird, they can really tell. And they quiet down and they focus. So if you're sitting there at the piano and you say, okay, violins from bar 25 to bar 30, play this. And I play it on the piano a bar at a time. Uh, in a kind of shorthand way, they would just write it down. Then, or maybe I'd have the copyist copy some things and some things i just play it for them four or five times and they would write it down. But what happens is then the winds are listening and the brass, so everyone's listening to what you're saying to the violins, where they normally would not listen unless you directed it to them specifically. And so everyone gets calm and focused. And in a matter of an hour, we added 50 bars to a queue. And again, it was much better than, than if I would nailed it in the first place. It, because of the magical experience, it, to them, to the filmmakers, it seems like magic. Here's a cue they just don't like. It's not working for them. And an hour later, they are a- absolutely over the moon about it. It's still the director's favorite cue in the movie. So, um, I, I learned that kind of early on with my toaster experience, which was personal to me, um, and then the throw mama, um, and then and then the Galaxy Quest was me more as a mature um, film composer, but um, that I actually was able to do it right there with everyone there. And uh, there are a lot of little instances of. Uh, you know, there's not much magic anymore in film composing because 
of these mock-ups, the director, they can hear, they hear about 80% of what it's going to sound like. So there are very few surprises anymore. There used to be lots of surprises. And it used to be like, I mean, imagine, imagine, imagine George Lucas hearing the score for Star Wars. I mean, I, I know John William played it for him on the piano, the theme, but give me a break. I mean, I, you know, and, and or or Spielberg hearing the score to E.T., a movie which I played violin on, by the way. I was there for E.T. Um, uh, uh, imagine what that's like for a filmmaker. He had no idea what that was going to sound like, really. You know, or ra or Raiders, or or um, now John Williams. That's still the way he works, but he's the only person in Hollywood that can work like that now. Everyone else, you have to present everything. So it there's very little magical that happens on a scoring stage, but when they ask you to change something on a scoring stage, it can it it generally makes it better, and it allows you a chance to kind of rethink a few things and 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 because they know you're taking the time to to fix it um and it's ma it looks magical to the people that aren't trained musicians and so m my sat i don't know what the word is but um I think we're yeah just I want, I want to kind of focus on that because I think that's a, a point that uh, a few uh, composers have 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 pay, have touched on this idea that uh, the mock-ups have have uh, changed music uh, fellow music in a way that is uh, not necessarily always for the better I mean your, your point of view would be that uh, it's you know the yeah. opportunity to do something spontaneous is essentially gone now. Uh, you know, but there's other people would say that the magic happens in the post production. You know, this type of uh, synth combination with the instruments. You know, so that they can take that back and they can you know do their magic to it in in their studio whenever the recording sessions are finished. You know, so. Um, I would probably tend to align with you and and uh, Chris Young and all those guys that are very much kind of of using the orchestra to tell the story, and uh, you know. But I think um, that mockups have also kind of dulled compositional writing in general. I find that Hollywood scores from anybody that's fairly. Uh, you know, in demand, their their scores tend to be fairly, you know, similar or safe. Or you know, like modulation, for example, is um, essentially non-existent now. You know, what would your thoughts be on on that um, type of you know those those intricate compositional devices that would distinguish like you know the the great composers from the mediocre composers? I guess I I think it's a pretty nuanced issue or question that's hard to unpack. Um, first of all it's here to stay. So whining about it, you know, uh, is not going to do anything, you know, and you're perfectly free to send a mock-up of something that is completely off the wall. I mean, no one, no one says that you have to, um, that you have to do exactly what's in the temp or close to what's in the, the temp. It's just, if you do, it, it's so hard for, it's hard for musicians, uh, hard enough for musicians, but for non-musicians that have listened to a piece hooked up with a image or a scene to get that out of their head. I mean, it's, 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 it's just like, it, it's just like brainwashing. I, I think from our end, I'll watch a movie and I look at the movie and I say to myself, God, this is terrible. This movie, you know, and then you watch a scene enough times and it doesn't seem so bad, you know, and then you watch it more and you put some music on it. You say, like, yeah, I kind of like this. And then after you're done months later and you look at the film and you go, you know, this film isn't very good. So I think it, it there's a there's a bonding that sort of takes place in the whole um, process. I do think that film contemporary films really cannot handle what you might call classic or like John Williams sort of neoclassic film scores. Um, they just, they don't, they don't, they're not 
surreal enough. They're 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 too realistic to to be able to um, um, handle that. And I do. There's you know there are most film scores aren't very very good from the beginning. I mean, like like most Western concert music, maybe we hear point five percent of it or or one percent of of what's written. And the rest of it, we, we we never hear, you know, from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So, so you know, we're we're kind of in in the middle of this. So, um, I think mocking up is on the plus side. It's a good way to talk to a director, and on the negative side, it's very hard to get away from it for the filmmakers because they've been listening to it for months and months, and you know. So we're listening to it too, the, the the composers, but not very much really. You 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 listen to it while you're uh, t- uh, spotting. Maybe you'll take a listen to it before you start writing your cue, and you you'll see you know depending on what kind of movie it is or what it is, and then you kind of don't listen to it anymore, you know. But they've been listening to it for months, so it's hard to pull them out of their their comfort zone. So that that that's that's a negative, um, and it's not that it doesn't work because they spend a lot of time doing temp scores. They hire music editors and it's almost like the same process of, as composing it. You know, I've done a few where I have composed the temp score, but I really don't, I don't, I don't think that works very well. Um, and then you, you start to get, um, uh, you, you start to get burned on it a bit uh, on the movie. If you're like, doing temp cues and then doing them over and over and, 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 and stuff like that. So how, how, how do you think, uh, how do you think, uh, mock-ups affect from the conducting side? That, that, that would be something I'd be interested to know about. And it doesn't affect at all. No. I'll tell you where it does. Uh, it does affect composing because you, you play to the strengths of your sample library. Yes. Yes. So if you don't have a certain kind of sample or it doesn't, sound good or you've sent it in mock-ups and it always gets shut down you tend to do the same kinds of things because those are the samples that sound good and and the whole idea is you have to sell the you know i mean there's a deadline you have to sell the cue to the director or you're gonna get fired or you're gonna get fired you know yeah pretty much everyone's been fired once or twice or or compromised you know just it's just a, a, a the way the business is so um I think that's a down, that's a, that's a negative too, you know? Um, so I, 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 I think another interesting thing now is the, the, the kind of supremacy of television now, yes. just of storytelling, but it doesn't have, television doesn't have the quote unquote history of film music. I mean, certainly John and Jerry Goldsmith and the, all those guys, generally started out in television but but the whole idea was to move to film as quickly as possible where your budgets and resources were you know 20 30 times what they were in 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 television so i think television and and television just you know they're they're long form so there's just so much music to write and it's expensive that um you know it just doesn't have, it doesn't have the same kind of uh history uh, of it so it no one quite knows what to do with television, it seems to me. I mean, I think a lot of scores are really good, but they all kind of blend into each other uh, mostly. I mean, like I just I just watched uh, Maniac, that uh, Netflix. I thought that was an interesting score. Once in a while, you'll you'll hear a score, I think, that's in, – and in, in, it's generally on the really crazy shows, you know, that are, that are kind of interesting. But – you know, you can be like super weird and eclectic and and then that starts to become a trap as well. You know, that it's what's the you know, what's the most original thing I can do, quote unquote. Um, and then and then it, it just like you get sort of numb to it because it doesn't really sound original anymore. It just sounds like, oh, yeah, that's that kind of score. And, yeah, that's that kind of score. And um, and, you know, what you're saying about. Basically, film scoring is is is, is 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 or classical film scoring is essentially light motives and, and Mickey Mickey Mousing, not in a not in a pejorative way, in a in a in a positive way of of you know a film like Raiders where 
there's so many same points in the film, but you know, you don't, it's, it's not like a Mickey Mouse film, but it is a, a film filled with themes. And, and then of course, Star Wars, which is the champion basically uh, of, of that. But I don't think that kind of thing works with the contemporary film culture. And I don't know where it's going to go. Um, the, the type of films that I did in the eighties and nineties and up to about 2009 and 10 that just aren't even being made anymore yeah i mean even like the use of melody in general like last time you came out of a movie theater and were able to was able to sing the theme you know yeah. i mean a lot of them talk about melody but it they there's a lot of talk now about um not leading the audience with music and strikes me as a bizarre statement i i get it in a way that of course means no melody that keeps coming back. I get that part of it. But unless you have music from beginning to end, um, anytime you bring in music or stop music, like right now I'm watching Jessica Jones, the first season, which I think is a nice score. Um, but there's a lot of no music and then music comes in and it is totally leading you. And it's not doing anything. It's not like it's, some melody that you've heard before or some weird thing or, you know, even though there's, a, there's you know, there's an infinite variety of, of, of samples and sample instruments that you can manipulate in hundreds of thousands of different ways. And that's what composers do. But as soon as music comes in, it's leading you somewhere. You can predict what's going to happen, you know. Um, I don't think Jessica Jones is the greatest show on television. It's just something I've been watching recently and it's just kind of, it's kind of interesting the use of, of, uh, of, of music. And I think, I think the season one was like 2015 or 16, but this is, this has been going on, I think, since really, really going since 2010 or, you know, you take a film like Dunkirk really tried to do something, I guess, without ever stopping the music. And then it's music is sound effects. And then of course they, they bring in the Nimrod variation from the um, uh, Enigma variations of Eldar at the, at the, because you you sort of had to do, and I think that was the director's idea. I don't I don't know. I, it film film is in a crisis. Film is in crisis right now. I think um, television is showing the paucity of ideas in movies these days, or with very little rare. Um, exception. I mean, there's certainly still great movies being made. Don't, don't get me wrong, but it's not the cult. It's not the zeitgeist of the culture. I, I, I think to a certain degree, television is more, but even television isn't really, it's, it's just this big mash of, of, uh, little kind of tribes and clubs that, that watch on YouTube or on in Instagram or, or, uh, you know, and I honestly don't know where it's going to go or what is going to happen with, um, film music. I just know that something will disrupt it. You know, I, 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 I want to say one more thing and then you can come in. I love looking at film music historically as a, as a series of disruptions. So where film music starts in 1930, right? There's no film music before. I mean, there, there's live scoring of silent film, but it's not ubiquitous. It's it, not ever hears it that way. So 1930, they start putting the sound on the film. And then 1933, Max Steiner does uh, King Kong, which is the, really the first, um, and it's a great story. They they take King Kong out, they, they show it to an audience and they get their feedback and the audience is laughing at King Kong and they have a terrible tryout. So Max Steiner says, let me write an original score. You know, that's how we can help. And he writes an original score. And now everyone's screaming and fainting, you know. Oh, so maybe an original score is a good idea. And it was very financially, you know, successful. And then, you know, my, and my father, Alfred Newman, is part of that. My father was there in 1930 uh, at uh, UA. And Steiner's at Warner Brothers. And, and then Korngold comes. And, and by 1935, he writes Captain Blood. And then... 1939 is that year of, you know, Wizard of Oz and Weathering Heights and Gone with Wind. I mean, by that time, if not before, it's a completely mature, classic Hollywood style, right? And then the studio breaks up in 1959, and 
even before then was say Alex North score jazz score to um Streetcar and then all the Mancini movies and all the songs that get it gets disrupted. And then there are you no know, and, and and then for about 15, 16 years it's that. And then John Williams first does Jaws, which is a, an old, I'd say a neoclassic score, very Mickey Mouse score, brilliant idea, but then he does Star Wars and everything changes. And then it's Star Wars until, you know, and then Elfman comes along and then Hans Zimmer comes along and eventually that becomes hegemonic. And I think that's sort of where we are now, which has been going on maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. And I think it's just interesting to look at that, you know, uh, classic Hollywood's about 15 years, then it's 15 years of Mancini-ish, you know, soundtrack stuff, then it's John Williams, sort of, even though John is still working, you certainly couldn't say it's the same culture. And now it's kind of, it's kind of the Hans Zimmer, it's the, it's a record producer culture, really. They, they, they look at it, which would be impossible without the technological developments, you know. And, and, so, and so most likely there will be a disruption in distribution, which there, we can all see and have been saying for years that distribution is going to change, but it really hasn't done anything on a scale yet um, where it's exploded. And I think at some point it will. And what that means for film music and people that love film music, I, I really, I really don't know. It's just, it's a sea change from when I started. I started before you were mocking up and now, you know, I have tons of equipment that I use every day to write and, and I mean, just picking up on a few of those points, uh, uh, there's so much there that, uh, you know, that's a week's worth of conversations. But just a few points there that I I, I was kind of thinking about was, I mean, this culture of, you know, I I seen your performance of John Williams for his 40th anniversary at the uh, Hollywood Bowl. And it was a Uh phenomenal evening, just from from beginning mm-hmm. to end, just mesmerizing, oh, yeah. uh, and we'll we'll get we'll get into your 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 conducting and how you interpret those scores that are so well known. But just to to close the door on on this 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 conversation is, I mean you you've helped and you've been part of the the pioneers of bringing um, film music to this kind of live concert setting. I mean this 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 kind of culture in Europe is especially didn't really exist five six ten years ago um you know you yeah. weren't going to see the the london symphony orchestra play john williams or play you know um oh. alfred newman your, your dad or anybody oh. like that um so th- this is a new thing right and the orchestras are finding a new source of income by bringing these uh scores uh that people loved you know 30 40 years ago uh to yeah. new audiences to the young uh, people that might never have seen Gone with the Wind or might never have seen uh, King's Row or any of these kind of classics films or the Hitchcock films or anything like that, you know, because uh, for a young audience, it feels dated, I guess, and maybe they wouldn't be able to sit through Vertigo or something like that. I don't know, but they would go see the the mu- the, the music because it's, oh, we're going to go see John Williams been performed at the Hollywood Bowl or we're going to, you know, yeah. this is something that's 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 new. I'm just not sure if, uh, you know, it's, I think composers working in the industry today are, you know, they, they're aware that it's probably going to be heard once. It, most of the music that's written today will be that, uh, you know, the 98% of romantic music that we've never heard, you know, yeah. and they're pretty happy uh, and they're, they're content with that, I guess, you know, um, that's just one point. How do you respond? Um, I don't know. I think everyone hopes that their music will live. I don't think anyone's writing music that's not trying to write the best music that they can. Um, I think it's it's it, it's akin to what I was saying about when you watch a movie as a composer. Um, you know, you're watching a scene over and over again. Um, you're 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 you but you tend to bond to it. Even if you don't like it, uh, uh, you 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 have to bond to it to write music for it. And then you, then you want to write the best music that you can. I don't think you're in your mind, you're thinking about, well, could this be in a con, you know, a concert setting? Cause obviously a lot of them couldn't, but it, it's not exactly true. Like, um, you could, 
you could perform, say, a movie like Dunkirk live, if if you if you if you wanted to. I mean, it there the technology is so good now with this stuff. Um, if you want to do it, you can you can get it done. I mean, whether you would choose to do it or or not is a is another thing. But I I I, I would think anyone would be happy to have music play concert setting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Or, you know what it is. And, but of course you're right. 99% of it won't ever be played again. And I think for my father's generation and even John's and Jerry Goldsmith generation, this is, this is like unthinkable to them. I mean, you should go back. I, I, I think I said at this concert, I talked a little bit about John's tenure at the Boston Pops. Um, I just finished a book about John by, uh, what's this guy's name? He's an Italian, um, it's called John Williams Film Music. It was, it's, it was like a PhD thesis, um, but um, he talked a lot about, th there was a, a, a bit about John's tenure at the Boston Pops and how incredibly nasty people were to him. Yeah, yeah. At one point, he just left. And they had to beg him to come back. And and here in Los Angeles, I think in 1982 or 83, he conducted a concert of his violin concerto, which is a it's a concert piece, and then some other music of his. And, and the critic here, Martin Bernheimer, absolutely skewered him and made the nastiest comments about film music, just in general. And I bet that guy's never, never even heard any film music at all to even make a statement, you know, like that. So I think, and in my father's time, Stravinsky and Benjamin Britten wrote absolutely horrible things about film music. I mean, you can find all kinds of disparaging remarks that are will take your breath away now. And even now, it's still, there's still a sense of cynicism, which you alluded to, that an orchestra is doing it because it makes money. Um, that's not why I'm doing it. <laughs> no, it's not why I'm doing it either. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? It, it's like, yeah. I know this stuff. The, the, there, Yeah, most film music is terrible. And, and a lot of it's really terrible. But d you can't tell me that the score to E.T. isn't masterpiece, or at least has sections that are, 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 are masterful strokes. And then explain, you know, explain to me what is film music. You know, film music is has to be very simple on the surface. It's 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 in service, it's functional music in service of a movie, as a ballet score is for a ballet, as opera is, of course, music is more hegemonic in those forms, but and and we're still trying to figure out what film is. How, how would you describe film as an it it there's no there's no other art form that makes as much money or has ever made as much money as film. It's commercial. Does that mean it's not an art? Are you going to tell me it's not? An, 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 a, and, 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 and B, you better study it and know all these scores and, and, and be able to, to, to make an argument about, about why it's a lesser medium. So I've always felt this way. Uh, early in my career, in 1988, so you, you see that's about three years after I started writing film music, so I'd done a lot of films by eight night. You know, we used to do like six or seven films a year. Um, I headed up the the, the uh, composer's lab at um, the Sundance Institute. But one of our programs was what we called a, a film music preservation program because very few people were doing this at the time. And if you wanted to do, say, a Mancini score or Alfred Newman, where do you get them? There, there are no, there's no scores. There's no parts. They're all in these studios libraries. They don't give a crap about it. It, it, it doesn't make them any money. It's a mess. It was it, so, so it takes somebody to go in and make it so that an orchestra can play it. So we did about five or six concerts and we did fundraisers and we must have raised at least a million bucks in those days so, um, at, at about five or six concerts. And then it sort of, we left and it kind of, it kind of petered out, but early on we were, we were, this was really interesting. I did a lot of conducting of those concerts 
a lot of them were uh, they were clip shows. They weren't full movies. Though I did do a silent film score to the Marno film um, uh, Sunrise um, to, uh, in 1989 that opened the film festival. Um, that's that, that's neither here nor there. We um, and then I really then I think John again to look at it a bit historically. John had already been at the Boston Pops and started getting film music into that orchestra you and you could you could safely say that at some point the boston pops was maybe the most famous orchestra in the world they probably had the most recordings they were probably the most visible on tv they were on tv every week when they were they had their season and during christmas and john williams was so famous by then and i just think little by little it chipped away at this horrible demeaning attitude that the arts community gave to film music. And then when the technology got to a point, which would be maybe 2009, 10, 11, 12, where it was much easier to do this, and then there was a system of how you could get the music and parts produced, uh, there were people at the studios you could talk to, uh, it could be licensed, and, and, and then you could do it as a, a, a movie. So the, the trouble with clip shows just to go off on this tangent, but your listeners probably don't know this. There are licensing problems with clip shows because it comes from so many movies. So it's like you rented, if you have like 10 clips, it's like you rented 10 movies. So you have to pay the money to rent 10. It's just, it doesn't make any financial sense. A movie, if you're a, an orchestra and you're renting a movie, it's like you're a movie theater and you're renting a movie and you don't worry about, you just pay the rental fee and then that, whatever money goes back to the studios and then the studios pay all the union fees that they're on the, on the hook for. So that's a much easier way to do it. So if you are doing a clip show, it's way more complicated to license it, or you have to cheat and just not pay anybody and hope nobody comes after you for the, you know, for the money, but, yeah. but really doing full film. And my interest always anyway, is to look at the music in its original context so yes. yeah, if it's live, you can hear it a little better. You can pay attention if you want. Uh, you have choices as a as a viewer. You're seeing the film with a large group of people, which is not what you're doing now. Mostly, you're watching by yourself or with your family. Um, so there's a communal feel to it. You hear other people react. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know what to make of it. And 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 these scores in this era are wonderful scores to play they're inter most of them are interesting and fun for the orchestra to play and and i think i've conducted lots of orchestra really good high-end orchestras and the more they play it the more they understand what it is you have to play it to understand what it is and not just one time and then you should have somebody in front of you that understands what it is to play a film score the the difference it is in playing brahms or mahler or, or boulez or Steve Reich or Philip Glass in concert and playing a movie. You know, there, there's, and, and that means you have to have a conductor that's good at synchronizing and good at conducting. And it's not just beating time trying to stay in sync. There's a lot more going on uh, uh, in it, ebbing and flowing and, and energy and, and, and pointing out what the hell's going on in the score. Why, it's, why this is important here, what what this means here, what he's trying to set up, why it seems so simple, you know, why there's not as much counterpoint or or modulation to, to your point, uh is is there might be in concert music, you know? Right. right. I mean so I mean just touching on on obviously uh you're short for time, so I'm I'm not gonna keep you too much longer, but uh, I would like to understand how you interpret scores that everybody knows and everybody uh, expects. Yeah. They, they everybody has their own expectation of what they what they how they know the music. So they might, you know, so they might have heard the original Star Wars and and they they like that original performance, or you know, they might have heard an interpretation by uh, John Williams' greatest hits on iTunes and it's performed by a different orchestra. Um, 
And uh, a, f- a second, uh, a B point to that question is: uh, I don't think when I, I don't think you were using um, streamers or anything like that on the Hollywood Bowl. I no, yeah, I was. yes, oh, I you was. were. Okay, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see them. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was quite far back. <laughs> um, uh. So, so can you talk to me a little bit about your interpretation yeah. of these extremely famous scores, yeah. and also I... how you execute that? Okay. Uh, first of all, um, I try to get as close as possible to what was in the soundtrack. That there is a there is a document which is the soundtrack. So I try to get as close to possible as possible. So it means I can't really go faster or slower. Say the main title of Star Wars. I could maybe go a little bit faster at some places and a little bit slower, but not enough that it would be really discernible because I am interested in being completely, utterly in sync. That I feel is my job is to be in sync and to make music, which means making phrases, which means making phrases out of rhythm. The most difficult part of performing film music live is because of the form of film music that it's it's not generally super dense. So there 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 are places where a character may be talking, but the energy keeps going. But there's no melody. But the the strings are going. Da, 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 da. They're just playing like eighth notes. Da, 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 da. An orchestra just wants to go to sleep when they do that. So the energy just wanes a, 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 a away. And you have to explain to them that this is all about energy. All the time, everything is phrased always. You always have to know where you're going. So you have to talk a little bit about that. But you try. I try to keep the talking to the minimum because I want to show them, because I'm very trained in conducting, I want to show them, um, show them, conduct it. To me, my goal is to perform the music as the composer intended it, which means how it got into the movie. Now, maybe in a concert setting, you're going to hear the music louder than you did in the movie, right? There's that. So the dub might be different, but to my mind, you know, except for Spielberg's dubs, most of them aren't very good, you know? Um, so it's it's nice being able to hear music and Star Wars and the fight scenes that that you can't hear in the movie, really. Especially when he went back and redubbed that first movie. Um, You know, when he put in all that CGI stuff. Um, He went back back and dubbed it. And I think then the fans got so angry that he he put out the the original version as as, as well. But aside from that, um, and then I want it it played to the death. (laughs) You know, I, I, it, it should be overwhelming. Film music needs to be overwhelming. First of all, in a theater, it's very loud. Everything's loud in a, in a theater, in a, in a movie theater. So in a, in a hall, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of environment. It, it's not made to be loud. It's made, to, it's made to blend. So you really have to push through. And so like I did, okay, a, a couple of years ago, I did uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. And you know that cue at the beginning the, the, where they're, they're all running around and the strings are just playing, you know, over and over, you know, it sounds like nothing unless they kill it. They're like a drummer. You don't want to hear a pop song where the drummer is just a big bore and the rhythm has no, there's no interest in the rhythm. You know, the only interesting thing is when you're playing a melody. No, film music a huge percent of, uh, percentage of it is rhythm and rhythmic phrases. You know, even a lot of the themes, like like the theme in um, Indiana Jones, it's it's a it's a motivic rhythmic theme. Yes, it has really interesting harmony implications. Yes, it's interesting that you don't really hear the whole theme till almost the end of the movie. There's a lot of interesting things that John Williams does, but still, in essence, ninety percent of that music is rhythm. You know, of, of the cues in that. So when I say phrasing rim- rhythm, meaning where are the inside beats in the rhythm? Where is it going? How many bars are in the phrase? And it's it's not something you can stop and talk about like every bar, you know, where rhythm is. You have to show them and you have to stop a bit 
to, to let them know that you're serious about this, that this is what this takes to to be overwhelming. It, if I feel like if it's not overwhelming, it just isn't, it's not been successful. It's just it be, and I think in a concert setting, the music should be a bit louder than it is in the, in the movie, just because of, of what it is. But I don't think that takes away, I think one way we tend to do that is, you know, it comes in stems. So there's a dialogue stem. Do you know, do you guys know what stems are? Yeah, yeah, we, we would know what they are. Okay, yeah. so a dialogue stem, an effect stem, and a music stem, a, a source music stem, say. So sometimes it's just, you just lower the, the, the effect stem a bit. And then everything, you know, it doesn't take away at all from the, the movie. So, so in, the, in the fight scenes in, in, in the Star Wars movies, you know, um, they, they, the effect stems got larger, you know, bigger and bigger as the series went on. So you just lower it a little bit in some of those scenes and then you can hear the, the, you know, the orchestra. I, I, I'm not saying it's not a challenge because it is. Uh, uh, it, it's, I mean, dubbing a movie is an enormous challenge if you've never been to a dubbing session my God, that that one when you when you're a composer and the first time you go to a dub session of move of music that you wrote, it's just horrible, just absolutely mind-bogglingly horrible. It's so hard to get all that information, that oral information on a what was a piece of film at the at the time. Now it's it's dig, but there's just only so much sonic space. So it is it is a struggle to balance all of this. So the only difference I would say in one's performance live is I think it needs to be amped up as much, if not more, than it was in the film. And I think the only other difference would be that the music um, will tend to be a little bit louder in most in most places. But I would still want every sync point hit. I'd want to rubato the way it was rubatoed in the in the movie, like the end of the end of the, the last uh, <clears throat> the last scene in ET. It's just just rubato all over the place, so I don't I don't want to just plow through it, you know. It, by rubato, I mean it goes slower and faster. So let's yeah. say ten bars of rubato, and if you just went straight through at the tenth bar, you would be at the right place. And let's say there really are no sync points in those ten bars. I still would want to slow down and speed up the way John Williams did. That would be my aesthetic. Yeah. So just curiously, and then, and then uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll wrap it up from here. So obviously, John was at that performance. Did yeah. you speak with him? Obviously, uh, you, you, he, did yes. you have any conversations with him about his interpretation of the music or, you know? He's very, very humble about his music. Um, he obviously, he's been wonderful to me. He's recommended me. He said wonderful things about me. He's recommended me. Uh, I've known John Williams since I was a kid. Um, not, I don't, you know, I'm not, you know, we're a very different age group. But um, last year we did have a fun time. Maybe it was two years ago. We did his concert uh, version of the piano version of uh, Sabrina that he did, the 1990 movie. And John sat with us to rehearse it. And there, there were things in it that I, I asked him because I wanted to know, you know, can I move here? Can I, should I rubato here? Is the tempo okay? Um, is the dynamic okay? And we had about 15 minutes with him sitting with the pianist. And, you know, John is a phenomenal pianist. Um, you know, one of his first jobs was, was in 1956. He played on the film Carousel at Fox that my father did the music for. But we had a great time. You know, the orchestra loves him. He's there. We would stop and ask him, you know, what do you think about this? And and that's really the only time I've really worked with him that way. He he doesn't tend to want to say anything about what one should do, except he just says very nice things and 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 all that. Um, I just think the older I get, the more admiring I am of not, not just his music, just everything that he he just made an enormous contribution to the LA Phil. Um, I know he's been blessed with, you know, financial rewards that just go beyond anything any film composer could ever imagine. But still, he's written a lot of concert music. He's been nice to a lot of people. He's been generous with his time. He's still 
is sprightly and and you talk to him and he's he's he he seems like a kid you know um and so i don't know it um th- that was my only real experience with him um rehearsing and i i really cherished it i we had a great i wish he'd stayed the whole time and we, everything we did he could he could wait on but it's just not it's not really his way yeah and do you think uh, Giacchino or Giacchino is a uh, an apt replacement? He's doing Star Wars now, right? Um, did he do? Well, he's not. He, he, he did. did Rogue, uh, he did Rogue One, and I think yeah, he's. I think he's doing is, nine. Is he doing somebody, nine? Yeah, no, no, he did. No, no, no. Nine is John. He's doing nine. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't um, think he was doing nine. I, no, no, he is. He's. I'm. He'll probably start working on it pretty soon. Okay. I think Mike did Rogue One, and then somebody else did the Han Solo movie. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Both of which I saw. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Those, <laughs> those those first three movies are pretty, pretty great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when, you, when it's compared to the 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 megalith that is, I mean, nothing ever is really gonna gonna compare. You know, <laughs> I, I I just like there are a few moments in in John's work that just blow me away. Maybe we can finish with this. There are two moments in his music of the, that I've been able to conduct that absolutely blow me away. The first, the first one is um, in Return of the Jedi when uh, Luke defeats Darth Vader and he pulls off his mask and you see, you're so shocked, at least I was the first time you saw it. He's this old man, nice old man, and he sort of starts to smile before he dies. And John brings back in the Darth Vader m- motive in a flute and makes it almost heavenly. It's the same, it's the same music. It's harmonized a little differently, but it's the same motive. And it just is stunning. It's so quiet there in the in the in the scene. And then of course, when he dies, the motive is then played on the on the harp and it's so simple it's just nothing and it, it's just it it makes your hair stand on end i i that i mean I, dramatically i think the moment is so great um it's, it's so terrific um anyway i i wish i wish return of the jedi had the original ending which i loved too uh, i don't know why they changed that but the other is et uh uh, uh it, it's it's a motive I like to call the menace motive, but it's 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 the the head. It's Peter Coyote's motive. Um, I forget the guy's name in the movie, but it's it's dun 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 that that motive. That's the motive for all. To me, it's the child's point of view of the menace of the adults, and you never really see the adults, you know, till the end of the movie, near the end of the movie. And of course, the adults are benevolent. They are not menacing but the kids don't know that they're trying to keep et away you know elliot is trying to keep et away so that that cue when elliot and et are in the 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 closet and the mother is reading peter pan to gertie and that beautiful harp lullaby thing is going and elliot puts his arm around et and they're you know it's just absolutely magical and then the camera pans out as the harp still is like doing the, 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 uh, like arpeggio lullaby thing. And it pans out into the a van that, you know, there's always somebody listening in, you know, are they, and, and then John does that theme with just a solo flute in a kind of low WC Ravel ish kind of register. All that's going and It's still in that, that air of the, of the lullaby. It's, it's just stunning. And again, it's the simplest thing, and it's set up by all the motives before, um, because that's the kind of film it is. But those two moments, whenever I do do it, um, just the, the, the very simple, short moments, just, you know, and I would tell the flute player, that I would stop and say something. Mm-hmm, you have mm-hmm, to play mm-hmm. it like, like it's the most beautiful, lush Thing in the world and it's really important and all she does is she goes dum ba dum bum 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 that's she just does that but it's so narratively important i think coming out of that uh, uh, connection and that 
it's it, it's like that connection is so strong that the, even the adult menace can't break it, you know, and because so much of it's about the connection between Elliot and, and E.T. Anyway, yeah. be that as it. I mean, oh. just just the the final thought here is uh, Conrad Pope was our uh, our orchestration professor. We had him uh-huh. for for two weeks, and uh, he he came in and he just stood at the, at the front of the class and just said, "John Williams is God," <laughs> and yeah. that that's it. You know, uh, but I mean, the thing that Steven Spielberg said was, you know, uh, when he heard Schindler's List was, uh, "I don't think I'm good enough to score yeah, your yeah. movie." And yeah. Stephen says, "I that's true, yeah. but the rest of them are all dead." <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. I think but, I used to play. I, I played on a lot of John Williams movies, and I played on a lot of Goldsmith movies. Mm-hmm. Goldsmith's the other. Yeah, Goldsmith doesn't get near the the attention that he should, just because there's not as many great movies in his his work. But Goldsmith was right up there with John. If you ask me, they're they're kind of yin and yang. They come from completely different uh, background. But I remember. Like I played on the original Star Trek movie, which we recorded for four days, and then they threw it all out. I mean, we must have recorded for five minutes in four days while they argued about it. And then he came back and wrote an, another, a completely different score. But Jerry's stuff was always difficult to put together. So I, I would say akin to this, like John's stuff just sounds really good right away because of the way he orchestrates. He has certain things that he does, and his his concept and aesthetic, a lot of it is about sound and what's going to sound good and in what range it's going to be. So it's kind of akin to say the difference between like, say, say Mahler and uh, Brahms, where Brahms just sounds plotting unless you, you really have to work on it. Or say like, say like a, a piece like La Mer of Debussy just doesn't, it, it takes a lot of effort to make it sound good as opposed to say Stravinsky, like Petrushka, which sounds great. I mean, it's hard to play, but it sounds great. I mean, La Mer is hard to play too, but even if you can play it, 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 it it's, you have to listen much harder. It's, it's much more difficult to make, to make sound good. And to me, John and Jerry, it was like Jerry, Jerry's music was hard to make sound good. And John's, and they, the, the, there are strengths on both sides of that, and I would say weaknesses. That's a very interesting comparison, John. I think Jerry Goldsmith really does not get enough attention uh, to what to what you know scores like um, uh, you know Planet of the Apes and that Star Trek score, and also uh, the Sand Pebbles. Yeah, he did, he did Chinatown as well, right? Yeah, that was amazing. And how about Chinatown? Do you, Chinatown scored for. You know, four pianos, four harps, a trumpet, percussion, and a, and, a, and a trumpet. And the first thing that's done in Chinatown is all four pianos strum from top to down. And then four harps play a single melody. And it's like water falling down into a, you know, lake and then the, the, the water bobbling up and down. Because the four harps in unison because they're not going to be absolutely perfectly in tune. It, it has this phenomenon of beating that it, it kind of like, like, wa- like water when you jump in water and it, it goes back and forth like little, little, little waves. Just that in, in like three seconds that the whole movie Chinatown's about water rights in Los Angeles. So, you know, it's just, it's so, it's so brilliant. Jerry did such brilliant scores um, for a lot of crappy movies, but, um, I, you know, he, he deserves to have these, you know, to be played live as, as well. We're hoping to remedy some of that. Yeah. I mean, uh, they, they do still include his thematic material in the, in this, the JJ Abrams star Wars stuff, you know, so mm-hmm. that's, that's still wonderful. He, he uses a lot of chromaticism very well, which I really like. Um, you know, who, who, uh, who does Jerry? Yeah. 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 But David, uh, I'm not going to waste any more of your time because I know you're super busy. But uh, I really, really thanks so much for for taking the time and coming on. Uh, last thing would be: uh, is there anywhere online where people can find you? Uh, anywhere you would want to point uh, social media, anything like that? Um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure what my Twitter handle is. I think it's at it's at D Newman. Let me let me let me look at what it is. It's at D Newman M five. 
So my initial, my last name, the letter M and five, that's me on Twitter. And then on, um, on Facebook, it's just David, you know, it's David Newman. I have a, I have a page that's David L. Newman, but mainly the page I use is, is uh, David Newman. Um, I also have a website, which is davidlewisnewman.com. D-A-V-I-D-L-O-U-I-S, newman.com. It uh, doesn't have very much info on it. it. It will have all the stuff I have, um, concerts that I have coming up. Uh, but I usually post about them in, on Twitter and Facebook as well. So. well that, that's great, David. I'll, I'll let you go. And uh, thanks again so much for Thank taking you. the time. Great, great talking to you. All right. See you soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.